For the first time in 16 years, the city of Boise will have a new mayor. Council President Lauren McLean defeated four-term incumbent Mayor Dave Beter in a runoff election December 3rd. She'll take over at a time when the city faces the challenges and opportunities of dramatic population growth. During the campaign, she listed her priorities as affordable housing, traffic and transit, and creating a clean energy city. Mayor-elect Lauren McLean discusses her vision for Boise ahead on Viewpoint. From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. Welcome to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. Lauren McLean will take over as mayor of Boise on January 7th, 2020. She defeated current mayor Dave Beter decisively in the runoff election. McLean won with 65% of the vote. She received 30,306 votes to Beter's 15,998. And did you know that in the 156 year history of Boise, McLean is the first woman to be elected mayor. Carolyn Turtling Payne served as interim mayor in 2003. My guest today is Boise mayor elect Lauren McLean. She is the current city council president and has served on council since 2011. According to the city of Boise's website, she will be the 51st mayor of the city of trees. So mayor elect McLean, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thanks. And thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. It's great to be here. Thanks. So what <laughs> have the last basically two weeks been like for you since you won the election? Well, the last two weeks have been a whirlwind, a really exciting whirlwind. Um, as you know, right after the election, I woke up the next morning because I did win on Tuesday night and jumped on a plane and went back to the Kennedy School where I joined 24 other newly elected mayors in a boot camp of sorts to learn about transition and taking over an administration. So spent two days with uh, Mayor Alex Simpson from Meridian, mayors from Salt Lake and Spokane and all around the country. How helpful was that? It was really helpful. It was it was one of those things that I'm, I wasn't sure if I should go or if I'd be able to go, of course, because I didn't know until late that night if I right. would be going. But I'm so glad that I did because I came back with a, a, a great network of current mayors as well as mayors elect and an understanding of you know, the right way to structure a transition. Um, we had conversations about hiring police chiefs, which is apropos course for yeah. what I need to do now here and a lot of other conversations about budgeting and priorities and so it was really helpful. And also of course it seems like it you know just having been on council for so many years <coughs> watching what the mayor does and, and working with council and city government and employees seems like that would really give you just a great background for stepping in smoothly. Yeah you know I often said during the campaign I really do bring more experience than any first time mayor has brought to the city because of my years as a com volunteer commissioner on the parks board and then a volunteer commission c commissioner on planning and zoning and of course the last eight years nine years on city council I've had a front row seat to what works and what doesn't and I'm really ready to hit the ground running but want to say too that the staff at the city is amazing and they are working closely with me now in transition, but I trust um, them so much. And they're, they're really the frontline um, care providers for our city, so look forward to working with them. Since the boot camp, whatever, so what, what have you been focused on? Because with the runoff election, your transition period was basically cut in half. Well, uh, it, so what have you been focused yeah, on? Yeah, and it was funny to arrive there the day after the election, be very tired, and be in a room of people that have been working on transition for a month and to realize that, oh my goodness, I have so much to do. But what we have done and what we've decided to do with this transition time is um, I got back Friday night after the election, Monday morning this week, I was in City Hall. We have offices for transition and since then I've been meeting with um, chairs of my transition subcommittees, city staff and department heads having a conversation about where we're at and where I hope we, we will go. And so spending this week and of course next week doing the same. And then in the first month um, in, in January, I'll continue to work with my transition team um, and we'll then have reports out probably towards the end of January. So typically that would be, you know, two months after an election, we're gonna make it a little faster, mm -hmm. um, but it just won't be before I'm sworn in. Taking a step back just a little bit, what does it mean to you to be elected as mayor um, and by such a, a wide margin? The, um, you know, that's something that I pause and think about every now and then throughout the day because it's really, it's an incredible honor and it's humbling. I feel this weight of responsibility that just makes me incredibly joyful and grateful, but at the same time grounds me in all the work that has to be done and my recognition that I can't do it alone. I have to have a great team and need this community behind me. 
and really appreciate the level of support I received in the election. I don't think that that's fully sunk in yet, to be honest. Um, but it tells me, too, that there's great expectations in terms of a mayor's ability to remain transparent and accessible to the community um, and also to work with the community as we move through this moment of growth. And um, also, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning of the show, you were, you were the first elected um, female mayor of Boise. How do you view the importance of that? Um, I think it's really important. And it, it also makes me feel that it's even more important that I do this well and that I am out in the community as much as possible so young girls and young boys um, see that, that the mayor looks different than she's ever looked before. And last night I was actually at a Christmas reception and a woman came up to me and told me about the conversation she'd had with her daughters the night before the election, they were nine and 11. And laying out the two candidates, she was trying to just present to them the things that she'd been thinking about. And both of them were like, well, mama, you gotta vote for the mom. And when she was telling me this story, it just, again, it reminded me of how important this is to so many people mm -hmm. and how I want to make sure that I, you know, connect with young girls, young boys, and others, and, and talk about what leadership looks like and set the stage for more. Because so often we're told as, as women and as girls that you really can't be it until you see it. And so now in this community, um, people can see it. And I hope that that inspires a whole generation of young women and young girls to yeah. aim higher. And you know, the Valley has been pretty uh, blessed, I guess, in that way as well. You have Mayor Debbie Kling in Nampa, yeah. Mayor DeVere in Meridian after yeah. a long tenure. Uh, yeah. just retired so carrying on that tradition as well in the valley yes carrying on the tradition in the valley bringing bringing that to Boise and also frankly carrying on the tradition of strong women um, throughout our city's history mm -hmm. that have led in so many different ways and that too um, you know I'll look to them and look to our history to think about how um, I am as mayor as the first female elected mayor okay so what is top priority number one as you take office top priority number one is to address affordability as quickly as we can with for some housing. quick for housing, with some quick changes, and then draw, um, you know, mapping out a long-term plan for, for what we need to do in Boise to try to do more and better um, to ensure that we have housing available at all budget points for our residents, um, and then also, I mean, it's I've got to get to work on resetting relationships, rebuilding relationships. I've reached out to ACHD about meetings in the first days. I'll have a housing task force meeting in the first days, and want to do the same with the legislature and the governor because we've and regionally leaders because we've got to get to work on transportation. So, how how critical is the affordable housing situation here, and specifically, what can you do about it right away? Sure, you know, I. The election results, I believe, show us how critical it is that people in this community and the thousands of people that I talk with face to face in this community are really concerned about whether or not they can stay in the homes they have, if they're gonna be able to find a home, um, or if they're gonna be able to meet next month's rent. And so a city can be creative in coming up with ways to encourage more builders of homes to include affordable homes in what they're building. That's apartments, condos, houses, et cetera. So I want to look at a couple different policies, um, a couple different incentives, work with those who we need to build affordable housing to figure out um, what they want to see in order to make it happen. I had a meeting yesterday with housing staff at the city to talk about what we might add into the mix. And then next week, my housing subcommittee for transition will be meeting. And again, we'll be talking about policy ideas that I expect we'll bring forward. Oh, I want to talk about opportunities that come with all the yeah. growth a little bit later also. But of course, another one of the challenges with growth is, is rise in homelessness. That was a big issue um, in the campaign as well. What do you want to focus on with homelessness? Yeah, well, I, you know, it, it became an issue, especially in the last four weeks of the campaign, which was really un unfortunate in some ways, the way um, those experiencing homelessness were painted in the community. But just yesterday, I sat down with members of the police force, the city's housing um, and homelessness policy director, to start the conversation about how we create a systems approach to address homelessness. And just like I said in the campaign, we have to prevent and we have to serve. And so my strategy working with experts and stakeholders will be to ensure that we grow out a program that keeps people in the homes that they're in, that supports those are that are close to being evicted so that we prevent additional homelessness, and at the same time seek ways to provide um, 
the resources that people need mm -hmm. in order to move off the streets into shelter and into home. Uh, do you mean to continue the like the housing first programs that oh, have been yes. started? I mean the thing is is great things have been done in the yeah. last since when is that since 2015 so the last four or five years and we've got to bring those to scale so housing for first is so important because it provides those who've not been in homes the services they need the health and mental health services they need to stay in homes and, and we'll be break, breaking ground soon on one for veterans we have one right now um, for others experiencing homelessness and I'd like to see us continue on that track to create more opportunity like that but also work closely with the shelters and other um, service providers to determine what people experiencing homelessness need um, to make it possible for them to move into shelter and then ultimately into home. Let's pause the conversation right there. We need to take a commercial break, but um, when we come back, I'll ask Mayor-elect McLean about other big issues, including traffic and transit, creating a clean energy city, and stadiums and libraries. Two pure beef patties, three slices of melty cheese. Biggie cheese? Oh, yeah. Hey, man, do you need help getting out of that thing? Oh, yeah. Hey, here, me, um. I'm not even sure how I got in, man. Motor in for a Biggie cheese before they're gone. And order ahead to try happy hour anytime. Visit your local Acura dealer for attractive offers on the MBX at the Acura Season to Performance event going on now. <clears throat> and now for the fun stuff. Accuracy is in a performance event. Hurry in. Getting a tasty breakfast sandwich with a quality cup of coffee, that's a morning victory. Getting it served quick and at a great price, that's like a morning victory with a parade and a marching band. Win your morning with a savory sausage biscuit for just a dollar and add any size coffee or soft drink for just a dollar more. Hot and tasty, fast and easy. That's breakfast at McDonald's. The Dish voice remote just got even more powerful. Why'd we put so much technology in there? You don't think I've watched a lot of football? You want to put a little wager on it? Bet. So you can settle that bet without ever taking your eyes off the game. How many D1 football teams are there? What you do with that power? Oh, it's gotta hurt. Well, that Woo, wait, is wait. totally up to you. Don't look so sad, man. Come on, we're having fun. New Dish Voice Remote with the Google Assistant. Dish, tuned in to you. This Fritos Chili Cheese Junior Wrap is only 99 cents. And that's a wrap. Right, but you know the commercial's not over, right? And that's a car. Yep, very good. And that's a camera. Three for three, good job, buddy. That's a Fritos Chili Cheese Junior Wrap while they last. Order ahead for happy hour anytime. And welcome back to Viewpoint, I'm Doug Petcash. My guest today is Boise Mayor-elect Lauren McLean, who has a few more weeks to serve as Boise City Council President before taking office as mayor. We're talking about her vision for the City of Trees today. So, Mayor-elect, um, let's get right to it again. What are your thoughts on traffic and transit as population continues to grow? Yeah, so I've heard from so many people during the course of this campaign, and of course before, that our commutes are getting longer, traffic and congestion is getting so frustrating. So we have to do a couple things. We have. Of course, we need help with this from the state to fund regional transit. But to do that, I believe first, we have to create a regional vision. And I intend to spend a lot of my time working with leaders across this valley um, to create agreement on a larger transportation system that could imagine, like from Caldwell into Boise, from Middleton into Boise. And then of course, in the city itself, we have mm -hmm. to do more to fund buses so they run more often. I, I was wondering if, if uh, I was going to ask uh, what form you thought that would take. Would it be buses or trains or something? Yeah, you know, when when I talk about moving people from home to work and everything in between, there's a couple different things. We <laughs> have to look at regionally, is that tr trains or is it trams along the rail corridor? Um, you know, we're 20 years behind on transit, but a lot of things have happened. So now there are trackless trams that are electric that we could look at using the State Street Corridor, for instance. Of course, buses are a big part of that, and I met just this week with Council President Pro Tem Elaine Clegg about looking into what it would cost to more fully fund a bus system within our city. And then, of course, pathways for people. So those of us that commute by bike or would walk to work or to the library or to school if it was safer mm -hmm. need to have those routes as well because every car off the road makes it more pleasant for everyone else. Um, in the election, of course, uh, the, the library and the stadium um, projects were 
a huge issue. They even had their own proposals on the on the ballots, props one and two concerning the library and the sports stadium downtown. Uh, the people of Boise decided they want the right to vote on future big money projects like those. Um, do you think a library of that scale and a sports stadium are in the city's future? I would s I believe that a library is in our future. And I believe that when done right and led right, a library will be also be able to pass muster with the vote of the people. Libraries are so important to our community. They create opportunity for so many. And so it's a matter of having a citywide conversation and determining really what feels right to the public. Because throughout this election, I heard that people wanted the chance to vote. They weren't happy with the library that we had proposed, but they knew and wanted to see a downtown library. So I know that we can get there. Just thought it maybe 85 to 105 million dollars. It has to be right for the time in which we are now, but of course built for the future. Mm -hmm. A budget that's right for Boise, a design that's right for Boise, and one that we're, that people celebrate rather than feel so controversial about. Would you support a sports stadium project? I've said all along that from a city dollar perspective, it's not a priority. Right now we have pressing priorities around affordable housing, we need to invest in tr transit to impact traffic and congestion. And with limited dollars, we, I, my priority is to do other things. Okay. Um, what is the plan for making Boise into a clean energy city 100% by, I think it's 3035, or 2035? 2035. 2035. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my goodness. Can you imagine like, you what we years. would look like yeah. in, in 3035? Yeah. That's kind of scary. Um, the <laughs> Yes, yeah, so right now we have a goal as a city, 100% clean electricity by 2035. I want to work with city staff, stakeholders, and others to come up with a plan to beat that goal because I think it's in the best interests of our residents and our economic future. And are you talking about city government being 100% clean our, energy? Our or? current city goal actually is citywide, that the electricity we'd be using would be 100% clean. So you're talking geothermal and, and hydroelectric? Geothermal, hydro, solar, wind, and, and as you know, Idaho Power too has now stated that their goal is to provide 100% clean electricity by 2045. So in many ways, we're helping them reach that goal because we're our residents yeah. make up m much of their service provision. I guess we hear 100% and we think, wow, I guess, what's the percentage now? So, I'm not sure what Idaho Power's mix is. I, I want to say it's in the 80%. So, you know, it, we've got work to do to get there. But, but it's not like going from 20% no, to 100%. No, and But that's actually only half of the thermal usage of our city. The rest is natural gas. And so, when I've also talked about wanting to make sure that our city government buildings overall are c carbon neutral in about the same time frame. So, we need to get to work on planning mm -hmm. for that and determining how we can take the steps. As our world changes and we look at what an economy of the future looks like, I believe that looking at climate and the opportunity that comes from clean energy and the innovations that'll require us to be ready for climate change, create great opportunity for our economy and long-term better paying jobs in this valley. But related to that um, environmentally is of course open space. The city has, um, you know, focused on pocket parks and other larger parks, the um, wonderful par parks all along the Boise River, preserving foothills, um, open space. Um, how much will you push for those types of things to continue? Those are really important as we continue to grow. And I've often said that as we grow and develop homes, we need to set aside open spaces in some form um, just as quickly. And as we grow as a city, we're gonna grow closer together in some areas, you know, we'll grow, we'll grow up, we'll have higher buildings. And so it's gonna be important for us to have a conversation about what open space of the future looks like and to really reimagine open spaces and pathways as mm -hmm. gathering places. So what do you see as the biggest opportunity um, that's being presented to the city of Boise? I see the challenges of growth and climate as incredible opportunities to shape our future. So again, we get back to how do we build an economy for the long term so that we can have the jobs we need to live here climate change, clean energy is an incredible opportunity. And when you merge that um, with the growth that we're experiencing and the opportunity that creates to map out and build the transit systems we need for the long term, mm -hmm. I think as long as we have the right conversation about where we are, where we wanna be and where we're headed, we have great opportunities in this moment. And with population growth too and the and growth of the city itself, do you see it as a, as a positive in terms of bringing in more tourists, uh, convention business, um, dollars that way, companies, jobs? I mean, we're gonna have to have more companies and more jobs as we grow, and so there's a lot of opportunity there. It's, good, it's a lot of hard work. We need to have hard conversations about the reality of growth 
the wages that haven't kept up with the market and cost of living and what we do to right size that. But again, when you have a new administration and a new opportunity to ask questions that might have been asked 16 years ago and haven't been asked since, with a new frame, because now we're you know at the, almost the quarter century mark in this 21st century, there's a lot of opportunity to have new conversations. And Boise is a young city, and we're growing at a time when we can take advantage of technological change, mirror that with growth, and, and my vision and our community's vision around open spaces and environmental protection, and see changes that I, that I think will protect the quality of life that we all live um, and love through this moment of growth that we're experiencing. And uh, we touched on it a little bit earlier too, but the importance of collaboration um, yeah. throughout Southwest Idaho, when the whole area, the whole valley is growing so rapidly, does, that, does the need for collaboration between mayors, between city governments, between, from city governments to county governments, yeah. How much more important does that become? It's so important. And it's between mayors, it's between city county, it's between city highway district, and city and the state. Because I've often said to my kids, you know, as goes schools in the state, so goes Boise schools and your opportunity. As goes the state economy, so goes ours. We really need to take this regional approach to problem solving, see it as an advantage, but focus, and it'll be a lot of my focus, on building relationships and finding those points where we agree mm -hmm. and building from those to create change for this valley. Great. Mayor Licht, one more time out. We'll come back with a short segment to, to wrap things up. So uh, we're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back. Here in the club, I can't even hear my own voice. Jack in the box would have been a better choice. The Jack in the box and experience the joy of missing out with my $3 mini munchies. Get them delivered with DoorDash. Only Jack in the Hello. Mom, are you going to make it on time? Don't worry, sweetie. We'll get there. I've been waiting for you. Here you go. Hello. So if you could be at the I've been imagining this day. Okay, everyone, now! Let me be the first to say welcome home. What's going on with you? Welcome home. Hi, I'm your host, Smokey Cole Bear. Filling in for Smokey, because after 75 years of... Only you can prevent wildfires. Turns out there's much more to say. Nearly 90% of wildfires are caused by us humans being careless, dumping our used barbecue coals willy-nilly. Guess the song was wrong. We did start the fire. That's why I respect Mother Nature and her trees, whether coniferous or new car scented. Go to SmokeyBear.com to learn more about wildfire prevention. Few things are more satisfying than watching an epic Arby's French dip soak up a cup of warm, flavorful au jus. The perfect ratio of sauce and sandwich. And what's that? You ran out of sandwich? Arby's knew this would happen. Which is a great time to bring up this backup sandwich. Two French dips for $6. Arby's, we have the meat. Hey sister, you triple rewardsing with Mountain America? You bet I'm Mountain America triple rewardsing. Are you triple rewardsing? I was born to triple rewardsing. I'll take these in a size triple rewardsing. Attention, price check on aisle triple rewardsing. <laughs> Garçon, more triple rewardsing for everyone. I concur. For a limited time, get triple rewards on every visa purchase. Only with Mountain America. This museum of fun was not a great call. Should have gone to Jack. They've got it all. At the Jack in the Box and experience the joy of missing out with my $3 mini munchies. Get them delivered with DoorDash. Only a Jack in the Box. Continue our, continuing our conversation now with Boise Mayor-elect Lauren McLean. Um, Mayor-elect, what do you have planned for after the swearing-in that the public can, um, you know, come talk to you or sure. meet you. So on January 7th at 6 p.m. at City Hall is a swearing in. And then on the following Sunday, I think maybe is that the 12th or the 11th, um, Sunday after the 7th of January, there will be an open house at the depot where I'll be attending and come meet the new mayor. But most importantly, we'll be launching the annual, the year long celebration of women's suffrage because it's 100 years in 2020. I want to just ask you a couple personal questions if you don't yeah. mind. And first of all, um, 
you, your husband, your two children, what do you enjoy as a family about um, the city of Boise? What do you do in your downtime here? Sure, in our downtime, we spend a lot of time in the foothills. To be honest, our son, my son, if you follow him on Instagram, you can see what he does in the foothills sometimes, especially with that new bike park. So he often bikes now by himself because I can't keep up with him. But we spend time hiking, um, mountain biking. Our kids learned how to ski at Bogus. You know, a couple days a week we go skiing and just love spending time outside. And then, of course, our kids grew up roaming the neighborhood and using the foothills, but also downtown as their backyard. Mm -hmm. Um, with the uh, with Christmas approaching and the new year, does your family have a holiday tradition that, that you look forward to every year? We do. Our kids love Christmas, and I love it because it's it's the time for the four of us to kind of bunker down together. And we always this year's a little different. Our daughter's overseas, so we're actually going to go overseas and and celebrate with her over there. But typically on Christmas Eve, we put on pajamas, wait for carolers to come to our house. They always come to our house. And then we make fondue and finish decorating and doing things like that. Um, and it's one of you the- You wait to finish decorating until well, we'll then? We'll always like put yeah. the final things on. Um, our kids just love having cheese fondue, chocolate fondue, and then doing a little bit of Christmas before going to bed. And even as they've grown, we've continued doing the same thing. And then Christmas- And then do the rest of it on Christmas yeah, Day. Yeah, and then, and then Christmas Day, the, the one thing that continues to be an annual tradition is ever since our daughter was three and saw the Nutcracker here and with Ballet Idaho, we started putting Nutcrackers under the tree, hidden in a way. And so every year, and they keep track of whose turn it is to find the Nutcracker. Oh, that's fun. Every year they'll look under the tree for the Nutcracker. So we've started about 17 years ago, Nutcracker c Collection. Some traditions you just never get too old yeah, for. Yeah, no, uh-uh. Well, Mayor-elect McLean, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Best wishes going forward, and of course, we'll continue to follow your career from day one. I appreciate on. it. Thanks so much for having me. You're very welcome. Well, that's all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you tomorrow on today's Morning News, and then right back here next Sunday morning for another Viewpoint.